Welcome everyone. Um, hope you're enjoying the last of the warm weather. My name is Katrina Navikas and welcome to um, our symposium on the Open Spaces Society archive that I've been working on at the Museum of English Rural Life. So um, it's an interesting range of papers we've got today and we've got an interactive session at the, the end. So um, and some housekeeping, please make sure you're on mute. Um, if you want to take your video off as well, that might be helpful. Um, also, we are recording this. We might um, put some of the sections up on the Merle YouTube channel um, in due course. So again, if you don't want to be recorded either, um, let us know or put it in the chat. Um, we'll be using the chat function for questions mainly, just to manage the, the group. Um, and there'll be questions um, in the first session after each paper, in the second session after all the papers. Um, and um, so if you've got anything or any thoughts, do put them in the chat um, and I'll manage that and I'll be chairing those. So session one, is um, focused on what I've been doing as Open Spaces Society Fellow at the Museum of English Rural Life. And also we have Ruth Quinn from the University of Hull talking about her PhD research. Um, then we'll have a short break for you to go and refresh. Um, apologies, I can't give you virtual coffee. Um, and then the second session, um, we have some really interesting um, material both from um, Adam Bennett, who's an independent artist, um, showing some photography. Mark Gorman um, about Epping Forest and his research. And we've got um, David Toft about the Kinder tres Trespass and Chris Chilton, who's just come from the um, Winter Hill 125 celebrations. And Keith Sands talking about the 1991 Range West Mass Trespass. Um, and then the final session, I will give you instructions, um, but it's a bit more interactive. Well, I'll be asking um, you to find the locations in the lantern slides and I'll give you some um, of the lantern slides that I can't um, locate, no idea where they are. So you can be of help to, to us as well. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm a historian of public space and popular protest. I work at the University of Hertfordshire, but this year I've been honoured to be the Open Spaces Society Fellow at the Museum of English Rural Life. Um, Sarah from the Open Spaces Society is here. I don't know if you want to say hello. Um, as is various other people, Kate Ashbrook's here, so welcome. Um, I do have a quick um, intro about the Open Spaces Society and then I'll talk about my own research and what I've been finding in the archives after I've um, passed you over to Caroline from the Museum of English Rural Life. But the Open Spaces Society is a registered charity and has been defending the open spaces people love in England and Wales since 1865. As Britain's oldest conservation body, it campaigns for stronger protection opportunities for everyone to enjoy commons, greens and paths. The society defends open spaces mm -hmm. across and pressures from development and assists local communities to safeguard their green spaces for future generations to enjoy. Over the last century, the society has preserved commons for the enjoyment of the public and has also been active in protecting the historical and vital rights of way network throughout England and Wales. Um, most recently in the past year, the society has enjoyed legal successes at Noel Green in Solihull, Clifton Downs in Bristol. They submitted 78 applications to register Lost Commons, covering 15.4 square miles before the deadline of the 31st of December 2020, and are continuing this work in Cumbria and North Yorkshire. Um, the Society relies on member subscriptions to fund its work and provide a mandate for action. Um, so it encourages membership. If you'd like to be a member, then do go to the website, which is www.oss.org.uk. 
Um, so thank you. I'll be back in a minute, but I'd like to pass you over to Caroline um, from the Museum of English Rural Life. Hello, thank you for that, Katrina. That was great. Um, I just wanted to welcome you from the Museum of English Rural Life um, and also to just take put this um, symposium into a bit of context. We've been working with the Open Spaces Society Archive for the last three years. They funded us with a project and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for that. So it was actually to catalogue archives that were newly deposited at Merle and to create some oral history recordings of current staff at the Open Spaces Society and then to produce some online content to promote the archive generally and also to fund um, Katrina's um, academic fellowship, which has been fantastic. This is um, a great culmination of the project. Um, and I've, um, we're going to post some of these links into the chat. Oh, thanks, it's already started. Um, so that everyone's got all that information as well. So we've, we've been doing some online exhibitions and Katrina's about to publish another one on the Merle website and also some blogs. Um, and there's some, a description of the archive on our collections A to Z list. So without further ado, I don't want to take time away from the rest of the program, but thank you very much to the Open Spaces and to Katrina for organizing this um, symposium. Great. Um, so I'm just going to spend 10 or so minutes just going through um, some of the findings that I've been doing already. Um, I've been mainly working on the lantern slides, which are a collection of over a thousand early 20th century transparencies. Um, because it's obviously been locked down for most of my fellowship, I've been working digitally. Um, but as you'll see, luckily I've been able to get a lot of the research done and you'll be able to help me finish that research by finding the last of the locations. Um, so what I'll just talk about now is what's in the collection um, and some of the themes that are coming through. Um, and I'm st still continuing to, to do this work and it'll feed into my bigger project, which is a history of public space in England um, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Can everyone hear me? I'm just conscious that... Um, Things okay, so we've just got the had the links to more about the collection. Um, but what I've been doing is building up a database, which you'll see um, of the locations, any links, any similar images, any linked archives to these thousand lantern slides. And what we find um, once we map them is that perhaps unexpectedly, mo expectedly sorry most are located in the southeast of England um, actually the majority are located in and around Surrey which is handy for me because during lockdown um, when we were limited to where we could go um, I'm based in Surrey so I was able to go out and about still and find these locations. Um, they're organised in boxes and if you're interested in the sorts of things that are available, we will be looking at the website, which um, the Open Spaces Society has made these images available. Um, and here are the kind of the main um, geographical and geological types really of, of items that are in the images. Um, there is a, a lot of the North Downs, particularly Box Hill and Leith Hill. So if you want views of Box Hill from virtually every angle, then um, do look at, at the slides. Um, there's a whole box on metropolitan parks and commons, particularly Brockwell Park, where I was at the, at the weekend, and Peckham Rye. Um, a lot on Mim Wimbledon and Streatham Common and Kenwood and Hampstead, because these are the, some of the early places that the Open Spaces Society and its earlier guises um, fought to save from enclosure and from urbanisation. Um, there's a whole box of Burnham Beaches um, and the conservators of Burnham Beaches have been very helpful um, in trying to identify where those trees are. But obviously, um, a lot of them are just pictures of trees, so it's very difficult to locate them. Um, there's a box of rivers, um, predominantly the Thames, and there's more Hampstead Heath and Wimbledon Common. 
There's a whole box of the Pilgrim's Way through Hampshire and Kent, including a lot of images of buildings. And you wouldn't have expected perhaps the Open Spaces Society to have a lot of urban images, but there are lots of street scenes and buildings around Canterbury and um, other places along the route of the Pilgrim's Way. Um, there's lots of ancient forests, particularly New Forest and Epping Forest. And then we get to perhaps the boxes that I'd expected to find in the collection. So obstruction styles, fences, signposts that they were campaigning to, um, to remove. Um, there's a whole box of random pictures of typical English countryside, I guess, um, of county landscapes from B to Y, although not all the counties are represented, and stock types of landscape. Um, some seem to be posed by actors, I think, or, or, or figures um, in Castle Coombe and also St Mary's Abbey in East Malling in Kent. Um, and there's also some portrait figures of some of the leading um, personalities in the preservation movement, such as Octavia Hill and Sir Robert Hunter. So that's what's in the boxes. Um, the majority of the boxes have um, images of urban commons and of rivers and of downland, which reflects the type of landscapes that the Open Spaces Society were um, campaigning to save in the early 20th century um, in and around London, the Metropolitan Commons, um, the South Downs and um, the North Downs, these areas that were being threatened by development. Um, so, as I mentioned, I went out and about spotting these locations um, in the depths of, of last winter, um, trying to find the equivalent um, places. Um, some of them were easy to find, some of them less so. These are the steps to Wallingham in Surrey, which is not far from where I live. So on a, a snowy winter's day, I went finding that, um, trying to pretend I was an Edwardian gentleman um, peeping over the fence, the, the reason why that um, fence on the left-hand side of the screen is, is so high is that there's a 1930s naturist um, resort on the other side of it, which is still in operation, but that's the Surrey um, suburbs for you. Um, so there's plenty of these kind of images that were easily identifiable, but a lot of them weren't, and I'm still working through trying to find um, them. Actually, most of them haven't been built on, haven't been um, urbanised, and that's testament to the success of the society in campaigning to preserve for them. Um, some of the themes that are coming through in the more academic research that I've been doing, um, one is the importance of ancient woods and forests in the collection, um, the New Forest, Ashdown Forest, um, in envisaging a type of Englishness and a type of landscape that was needing to be preserved. Um, the rural idyll, um, I can see in the, 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 the guest list today, there are um, historians and academics who've written quite a lot about um, the so-called rural idyll of the 1920s, 1930s, this image of Englishness that was um, based around a particular type of countryside that was presented as needing preservation and was being threatened by urbanization, by modernity, which is my third theme. So there are images of advertisements, of petrol stations, of litter, um, of roads, and um, the incoming of modernity into an older Britain, that um, or an older England, that the countryside preservation movement, not just the Open Spaces Society, but also allied and federate groups um, and parallel groups like the CPRE um, and SCARPA, the society um, who were campaigning against advertising um, on, on billboards, were trying to um, at least manage and control, if not prevent. And then a third, a fourth theme is obstruction. So the society's um, attempts to um, keep footpaths open, keep rights of way open from individual landlords who were obstructing them um, through fences and gates, for example. So um, that's a quick overview of what's in the collection. I'm not gonna say much more. I've got plenty more I can say another time, but I wanna give room for um, the other papers. Um, but I'll just sort of share 
few of the images that I found the most evocative, um, and I'll be sharing on the um, Merle's website soon, um, that I find that were my favourite, basically. I'll take Chair's privilege in showing you my favourites. This one, I think, fits into a sort of gothic um, image that I didn't expect to see in, in a collection that was based in 1920s, 30s, rural idyll type of imagery. This is the path through the pine wood of West Wickham and a, a slightly enigmatic um, figure going into the, the darkness of, of, the, um, of the pines. Um, try, still trying to locate it and I'm in correspondence with various members of the Open Spaces Society to try and find out exactly where that is in, um, in this map. Um, so again, if you've got any ideas on that, um, it's a particular sort of um, plantation that has morphed over the years. Um, there's tons of images of Box Hill, as I said, and there's some wonderful ones of showing Victorian and Edwardian leisure time. Um, and very similar ones you could see today. Um, people still sit in that same place, um, just by the, the monument of the viewpoint, um, enjoying the, the view of the North Downs. Um, and then finally, um, this one is quite an enigmatic lady. And I'd love to know who she was. Um, I will say about these lantern slides, there's very little metadata, there's very little um, contextual information about them. Um, but this is a path at Cookham um, in Berkshire by the Thames and a lovely parasol lady on a beautiful summer's day um, enjoying the flowers there. So I'll stop there. Um, I've got plenty more images that I can share in, the, in a later session, um, but that's just to give you a flavour of the type of um, material that's in the collection. Has anyone got any quick questions about that? No, well, I'm, I'm delighted to move on now to Ruth Quinn, who's a PhD student at the University of Hull, um, and who is going to be talking about heritage and salt air um, in West Yorkshire. So I'll hand it over to you, Ruth. Hello, everyone. I will just get these slides going. Right, can everyone see that okay? Brilliant. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks so much to Katrina for organising this event and to the Open Space Society and the Merle for providing a forum for these important conversations. Um, so today I'm going to provide a brief introduction to my PhD research and some of the broader questions about open space and landscape preservation um, that has been raised so far. Um, so my research focuses on the historical geographies of landscape amenity at Saltaire and how the environment has been framed as part of the site's heritage value and significance. Um, so to provide some context for those of you not familiar with the site, Saltaire is a planned model factory village near Bradford in West Yorkshire, which was founded in 1853. The place takes its name from Titus Salt, the wealthy industrialist who commissioned the construction of the town, and Air, the, as the river air that runs through it. So like the surrounding towns of Shipley and Bingley, where I'm beaming to you from today, um, the industry which drove Saltaire was woolen manufacturing, specifically the spinning of alpaca yarn. So Saltaire was built to move Salt's existing mills and workforce out of the overcrowded and polluted centre of Bradford into a purpose-built model settlement. As such, the surrounding Air Valley, with its wide open spaces of wood and moorland, forms an important part of the site's landscape. The surrounding open spaces, as well as parks, small gardens and allotments in the village, were important parts of the 19th century sanitary environment of the town. So on the slide, you can see an image of um, one of the residential streets of Saltaire, looking out towards Hope Hill in Bailden. And the domed building is the United Reformed Church, which was commissioned in 1853. So the mill seats to operate in 1986 and the community raised concerns about the preservation of Saltaire's distinctive built and landscape environment. And the mill was subsequently redeveloped as a centre for arts and enterprise. It's got a very nice copy there, you may have been there. Um, and Saltaire was awarded UNESCO World Heritage designation in 2001. Research has examined how nearby popular beauty spots, such as Shipley Glen, shown here in the early 20th century, formed an important space for community formation and recreation during the first phases of Saltaire development. 
crucially, these nearby open spaces and surrounding landscape were represented through 19th century prints, newspaper accounts and poetry as a beautiful and healthy environment. Subsequently, these representations of the landscape have been framed through heritage documentation as evidence of Salt's progressive approach to housing and landscape preservation at Salt Air has largely focused on protecting the scenic quality of landscape views in the buffer zone around the World Heritage Site. So buffer zones are a means of protecting World Heritage Sites from so-called negative influences. So areas in a buffer zone are not necessarily of the outstanding universal value, which is required by UNESCO, um, but they're considered as spaces which might influence the authenticity of a World Heritage Site. Um, so you can see the buffer zone for Saltaire there. The space highlighted in red is the model village. And then you've got the broader area of the buffer zone around it. Um, so at Saltaire, the buffer zone has primarily been concerned um, as in terms of open space, um, as a link to the original rural setting of the village um, as an important part of the improved and healthy environment for industrial workers at the town. However, John Pendlebury et al. have, problem have problematised the use of buffer zones in planning and heritage conversation, especially in urban and peri-urban areas, due to the challenges of attributing authenticity in dynamic changes places. Um, so today I'm going to briefly introduce to you some of the, the context around um, agricultural spaces at Saltaire. So there are significant numbers of, fa of farms around the site. Um, and there are connections to agriculture in terms of um, Titus Sol owned some of the farms around Saltair and significantly two of his sons developed model farm nearby. Um, and these spaces have largely sort of been presented as kind of rural remnants um, of this original setting within the World Heritage documentation, um, particularly um, what, what's really interests me is in this description of Fernihurst Farm, which was Edward Salt's farm, it's described as this link to this original rural landscape. However, of course, as we, we know, that concepts of rurality shift and change over time. Um, so in my research, um, I came across this um, description here of the landscape at Milner Field. So Milner Field was Titus Salt Jr.'s model, model estate, was developed in Bingley, which is about two miles from Saltaire. And here we've got a description of the landscaping of the estate. Um, and what's really interesting here is how the spectator kind of describes how these walls, which you can see in the picture there, have you know, rid the district of, of the quaint picture, picturesque hedgerows, which rendered the district rurally interesting. So here we can see how this conception of what is rural changes over time. And of course, um, hedgerows have their own history of um, protest and resistance, but over time have kind of become stabilised as this image of the English countryside. And now when we look at this, this landscape at Milner Field, it kind of has this air of, of authenticity um, and um, establishment because it looks like quite a mature rural space in what is quite a densely urbanised area. But as we can see, um, this space has developed quite a lot over time and the current mode of assessing world heritage landscape significance doesn't really reflect this these processes of change in the landscape. Um, so Milner Field Farm um, still remains in use as a dairy farm. Um, the estate at Milner Field has fallen into ruin, but the farm in itself is um, a tenant farm. So it was only a, a home farm for a very small amount of time. Um, and it was first let to tenants in 1880. Um, since 1902, Milner Field has been um, tenanted by the Downs family who continue to ma manage the site today. So in 2015, the current landowners at the site proposed a development um, to develop a college campus for Bradford University at the site. Um, and this prompted a really interesting episode where sort of different views of landscape significance were kind of mobilised by the different actors involved in the campaign. Developers um, positioned the town, um, not the town, the farm as an eyesore essentially, um, due to the sort of existing, as you can see in this picture, sort of um, more modern additions, 20th century outbuildings and things like that. So they proposed that the heritage assets would be maintained, better maintained at Saltaire by sort of re-landscaping the farm, putting in new buildings that were more appropriate to the site setting. Um, and again, um, the community group who tried to um, 
sort of resist this um, development, putting an application to Historic England to list the farm. However, as you can see here with this quote from the um, decision, it was decided that um, Milner Field was representational rather than exceptional due to the modernisation of the, the farm buildings. And I think this episode really kind of raises questions about, you know, the criteria on which landscapes are assessed in relation to World Heritage Sites, because here you've kind of got the, the more everyday um, heritage of agriculture, which obviously changes over time, um, being assessed against this kind of monumental narrative of significance, which is on display at Saltaire. Um, however, the, um, the local community group pictured here, um, who was supported by Bradford Green Party, um, assembled a different version of heritage significance at Milner Field, which was largely based around locality and this kind of a more quotidian version of heritage. Um, and uh, we've got a quote here from the tenant farmer, David Downs, um, who's kind of positioning the significant of, significance of the landscape in reference to the local community and in reference to you know, his, his family's business. Um, and I think it just, this whole episode kind of prevent, presents that duality of, of the ways in which that landscapes are viewed. And particularly how, what's really interesting is how sort of, landscapes at Saltaire are kind of assessed against this kind of typical scenic, you know, scenic vision of rural England, which doesn't really reflect the realities of a very peri-urban industrial landscape, um, which is kind of the main tension that's been running through my PhD. And I think I thought I was about to run out of time, so I've, I've rushed through things a bit, <laughs> a bit of time for discussion. Um, so yes, I think... Um, this episode has kind of raised these questions about whose landscapes are viewed as being significant in, in, re in reference to a World Heritage des des designation. And again, whose heritage? Is it heritage of the Salts and the Salt family? Or is it the heritage of, you know, the Downs family and the tenant farmers, which um, continue to shape the landscape around Saltaire? So thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. I'm sorry if I rush through things a bit. It's been a while since I've done a talk. <laughs> I think we're also concerned about running over that we're running early now, which yeah. is great in some <laughs> respects. While people are getting their thoughts together about Ruth's um, talk on Salter, there are quite a, there's quite a bit of chat going on, which uh -huh. is great. Um, so there's some chat about rivers and flooding so thank you for that so there's um ray and jeremy are looking at floods and um there are there are quite a few people working on early modern um periods so 15th 16th century floods that i know of um and i think people are a lot more um, interested in thinking about how we can use historic archives such as images like the lantern slides for seeing environmental change, erosion, flooding in a way that I, I don't think has been used before. So I think it's a really interesting way. I don't think I've got the expertise to, to work out things like that, but um, there's certainly a lot of archives that haven't been um, uncovered um, in that or used in that way. Um, Martin was asking about where were the lantern images stored, how are they found, who's creating them now? So apologies, I, I skipped through quite um, briefly what lantern slides are. Um, but for those of, the, those of you who don't know, um, lantern slides are um, basically projection slides um, that would you would project onto a wall or onto a screen. Um, and it seems very likely that the Open Spaces Society and its predecessor, um, the Commons and Footpath Preservation Society, um, used these slides in talks and lectures um, to illustrate their successes. So I think a lot of the um, images of parks, for example, were taken just after the parks were um, taken into ownership by the local authorities, for example, um, 1925, I think one of the, the South London parks, there's quite a few images of those. Um, so I think 
that's why I was expecting to find a lot more images of places that perhaps would have changed significantly. Actually, I, I found that doing the then and now images, there's not that much change. Um, there are a few exceptions, but generally things have stayed the same. And I think that's testimony to the fact that these places have become preserved because of the campaigns. And so the Open Spaces Society would have taken a box of lantern slides out um, to some you know, village hall or to, um, to a talk and said, Here, here's some of the places that we've succeeded. Give us some money to, to help with our legal expenses for the next trial, please. Um, so I think that's the kind of context of the lantern slides. Um, the collection is now held at the Museum of English Rural Life and the Open Spaces Society have digitised them and put them on the their website. And Kate has kindly put the, um, the web link on for you. And that's what we'll be looking at later um, at the end session. We'll be exploring that more of those images. Um, but I think they, they're definitely a snapshot in time, not just of the places that are preserved by the society and by the commons preservation movement in general, which was at its height really in the 1920s, 1930s, um, but also that snapshot of um, the places that get preserved um, and the sorts of places that are seen as important at that period, which tended to be, as, as my kind of data showed, um, urban commons, okay. Um, and downland, south, southern downland. So obviously there are other societies and other federate societies in other parts of the country, um, but most of the collection is, is based around the southeast of England. Um, there were very few ex examples, for example, of the Lake District, hardly any um, of, of that and nothing for Scotland. And that's just partly because there were different groups campaigning for those places. Um, at that particular time. Um, okay, I can see Jeremy's got his hand up. Jeremy, do you want to ask your question? Thank you very much, Katrina. Um, I really enjoyed both both papers. Um, you, you had absolutely lovely kind of maps and um, illustrations sure. through that was was really enjoyable. And I wish I'd had more time to kind of absorb some of the um, some of the the really interesting quotations that you had as well. Um, but the thing I wanted to pick up on was something that you'd mentioned, Katrina, um, and um, I was, uh, there were lots of really interesting points, but I was particularly interested by um, what you were saying about the prominence of woods and forests and trees um, in the Open Spaces Society material. And that put me in mind of a, a, a book which I think has unfortunately rather kind of disappeared, so I don't think it's really very widely known, um, but have you come across Peter Howard, Landscapes, The Artist's Vision? No. No, I, I don't think many people have, but um, it's Sit a really fascinating, now. yeah, it's a fascinating study. And what he did, um, he looked at um, all of the landscape paintings exhibited at the Royal um, Academy's um, annual summer exhibition. And he, he approached it in, I, I think, a really lovely kind of quantitative way. So he just actually kind of um, recorded um, where these paintings were of, which counties and also which type of landscape. And he found really fascinating shifts in terms of the types of landscape that, um, uh, you know, the painters kind of were most interested in. Um, and I, ever since I kind of came across that, um, I, I thought that there's a huge kind of unwritten history there because, um, of course, it's not just kind of um, painters who, who may kind of have uh, changes in their landscape interests and preferences over time and there's a much wider kind of um, social cultural history to be investigated um, there so um, I mean I don't really know this is quite a question but I, I, I and I just wonder whether that isn't an area that we as historians could possibly think about looking at, 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 at more how maybe it's kind of woods and forests which have a particular kind of prominence at one time and then maybe other types of landscape in different different contexts. It's only the, the emphasis on the foxes of forests are on ancient forests and they're quite keen on, on recording um, ancient trees. So again, I think that's partly because of this emphasis on what a classic English landscape is at that particular period. So they want the old oaks um, in the new forest, the, the, the famous ones. Um, and 
but also, I mean, the, the Burnham Beaches ones are literally slide after slide after slide of individual trees, but they're not the ancient ones, they're just beaches. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm still intrigued by the Burnham Beaches collection. Um, yeah. um, it might have just been maybe more to do with the ecology. I th there's less emphasis on ecology in this period, um, and it's much more about the aesthetic definition of amenities and, and landscape beauty. Yeah, I think you're definitely right about the individual trees. I was walking in Savonnake Forest, which you also mentioned just um, a few weeks ago. And I, I mean, I was fascinated by how many of the really ancient oaks, I mean, many of these date back sort of, well, many hundreds of years, certainly. But lots of them have kind of names. Um, and there are these kind of plaques next to them. I don't know what the cathedral oak or the kind of, I can't, I can't I'm afraid I can't really remember the, uh, the names. They're quite evocative. So, I mean, that would be a lovely little subject for someone to investigate the kind of um, the kind of sort of popular names that people have given to trees and that there must be a whole history there, I think. I will say my, I'm putting my, my flag in that my next project, I'm always aiming my next project will be on the 87 storm. I'm quite interested in doing something yeah. on that and the yeah. fact that a lot of these trees don't exist because of that. Um, I've got a question from, well, thanks Jeremy, um, I've got a question from Annabelle um, for Ruth. Is the preservation of sites generally now incorporated into the planning system? Would you like to say anything about planning? Oh um, gosh, I mean, my, pro my project is sort of an interdisciplinary exploration between historical geography and heritage studies. So I kind of, with Saltaire, you, you read a lot about town planning and the planning system, but I can only really comment from um, experience of rural heritage sites. So with rural heritage sites, yes, that's why you have the buffer zone. Um, so development is restricted in that area, but it is it is kind of subject to external forces. And of course, as we've seen with Liverpool recently being stripped of their UNESCO World Heritage designation, um, the preservation can kind of come into conflict with other sort of commercial developments. And because um, World Heritage status is kind of an honorary status. Um, local authorities and governments can kind of um, go against the, the grain of, of the UNESCO way of seeing things. And then I guess sort of with, I mean, there's a great resource if you've looked at the, the magic map from DEFRA, um, where you can look at a local area and you can see all the levels of sort of planning preservation. So there are sites around Saltaire which have got sites of scientific interest. Um, protection such as Bingley Bog nearby so they won't be developed and then the sort of the areas within the World Heritage Site itself like the park um, won't be developed on because it's listed but then yeah the area that's why the the um, development at Mill on the Field was so interesting um, and at the moment in Bradford we've got um, a local housing plan going on and different people in the community sort of assemble different meanings to, about heritage around that in terms to, to kind of seek preservation for their local open space. Truth. Um, I've got a defense of Burnham Beaches from Helen in the chat saying that it is classified as ancient woodland beaches can be ancient too. Yeah. Um, I just, I was surprised by how many pictures of beaches there were in the, in the collection. Um, do look at them if you're interested. Um, I've got a hand up from Mark, if you want to ask your question. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thanks Ruth and Katrina. But yeah, as, as Jeremy said, really interesting presentation. I was uh, interested in the, the whole concept of the buffer lands um, around Saltaire. Epping Forest, which I have a great good fortune to live alongside, also has buffer lands to the north. Um, <clears throat> I was also interested, uh, Katrina, by your comments about pictures of trees. You, you sent me pictures of, of Epping Forest, which um, even the combined expertise of all the Epping Forest fans have failed to identify quite a number of them because they are just trees taken in the 1930s. But what's interesting is, is that actually Epping Forest traditionally was not a tree, a tree heavy forest landscape. It was open, it was forest pasture. And it was forest pasture because of the grazing of cattle for over a thousand years on Epping Forest. In fact, City of London Corporation who manage Epping Forest have in the last 20 years reintroduced cattle in order to, um, uh, to, to try to re restore 
some of that uh, open pasture landscape. And that's been quite fiercely contested at times by people who think that forests are dense woodland. Um, and uh, so, um, but I did have a question for Ruth about, uh, is cattle grazing part of the, um, uh, the buffalo land um, strategy around salt air? And if so, do you know to what end they are grazing there? Um, it, it sort of is, but it's very loosely defined. So um, the World Heritage Management file references pasture quite a lot. Um, and also some of the, the sort of the sites of scientific interest that I mentioned reference species that, you know, grow in, in pasture areas. And the, the cows at Milner Field are grazed outside for as much of the year that they can. Um, so the farmer there, it's not an organic farm, but he's kind of farms as traditionally and as as much outdoor as the the, the weather will allow. Um, but again, yes, and that was kind of one of the arguments that was the the local campaign group put forward sort of an ecological argument about keeping the farm there. And you had kind of the the university sort of having this idea of tidying up the woodland and having this kind of protected area like that. And then the local heritage group having this sort of more, it was interesting sort of a view that kind of kept the woodland sort of overgrown and a bit more wild, but then sort of kept the management of the farm and kind of worked towards this kind of picture of ecological stewardship, um, which kind of drew on kind of the, the history of, of dairy farming within the Airedale um, area. Right. Um, I'm just going through the chat. There's lots of um, suggestions of themes coming through, which I haven't thought of. So this is really useful. Um, so as well as flooding, we've also got more um, useful references for um, forests and, and woodland and, and conservancy. Um, and also, Ben Anderson says there's a history of scheduling that someone needs to write in terms of um, how it moves from the mid-Victorian era to now be um, managed by Historic and Natural England. Um, and we've got some helpful links from people who are also connected with particular um, woodland, such as Wokingham District Veteran Tree Association, um, Hampstead Heath. So thank you all for your contributions. Um, has anyone got any final questions for this session? before we have a break. What I can do actually is show you a few more images just to whet your appetite for the last session. Um, so I'll do that and then we'll have about a 10 minute break for you to, to get an ice cream um, in this weather. So, um, I'll see that hopefully. I like this one because it's it reflects the Open Spaces Society logo, I think. And again, it, it reflects that image of downland that is quite prevalent in a lot of the imagery of this period. Um, some of the images can be identified as by known photographers. So Henry Taunt was a known um, photographer um, and that's his image. Um, you can also correlate some of the images with um, postcards from the era. Um, that's how I'm identifying a lot of places that I'll look them up on auction sites, for example, um, or there's um, reproduction sites that have the, the old photographs and quite uh -huh. often they're the same. So um, there are quite a few that are, are similar to that that are by known photographers. Um, but this is what I was talking about in terms of the intrusion of modernity in some of these images. There's not that many, um, but this involves um, a legal case that the, the Commons and Footpaths Preservation Society was involved with in 1925 against um, a shopkeeper who, who bought the sort of um, land at the top of the um, downs at Patcham, which is the, the downs that you see as you go into Brighton on the train um, and let it out for big billboard advertisements of, of several 
um, you know, 40 foot long. Um, so you can see, for example, that one there is Giggins Bread um, Bakery and the bakery and um, the landowner and some of the other advertising um, people were charged um, and, and sued for, um, for despoiling the, um, the landscape. And um, the Commons of Footpaths Preservation Society then pushed for a local bylaw against um, large advertisements and they were supported by SCARPA who were the association specifically set up against um, billboards and advertising and it was becoming such a big problem in this era and I think they were they were fined um, I think it was 10 shillings a day every day that the um, the advertisements were still up there the landowner was fined um, so they, that reflects a specific legal case and you, we do have some um, other images in the collection, particularly ones about obstructions that show, um, that are connected with particular cases. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with some um, rural modernism in terms of um, the petrol station, which is was built on the side of what became the Ewell Bypass um, in Surrey. And again, this was seen as the intrusion of the urban into the rural. Um, a lot of preservationist societies weren't that against motoring in itself. Um, they saw that the pleasure motoring and leisure motoring was a good way of seeing the countryside. And they produced guides to um, the countryside as viewed from the from a car, from a motor car, but the complement of, of the motor car was um, intrusions such as petrol stations. And the first sort of enterprising business people um, along the kind of Surrey byways as people were, um, middle-class people were motoring as, as on the weekends, um, set up um, specific petrol stations, whereas previously you'd have to go to a cycle shop or the village shop to get a can of petrol. Um, pe the um, American um, petrol companies, um, increasing sort of this, this is a BP one, set up um, these new petrol stations. But you can see they're still pretty rough and ready in the um, countryside. So this was again part of the campaign to um, tidy up the, 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 the roadside. And there was a roads beautifying association. Um, as well that was campaigning for against the um, intrusion of these urban urban intrusions into into rural life so there's plenty more of that kind of thing as well so and um, we'll be looking at some more in the in the latter section but it's 10 to 3 now so um i've scheduled in a 10 minute break so you can go and um might get a cold, cool drink or an ice cream, depending on how hot it is um, in your um, part of the world. Um, and we'll see you at three o'clock for the session on um, commons and trespass and um, an interesting range of papers. So thanks ever so much for your contributions so far. And I um, shall see you in 10 minutes time.
Right, welcome back everyone. I've just had an ice cream, so hope you're um, jealous of me. Um, so this next session is um, focusing on the commons and trespass, and it's um, perhaps um, a mix of creativity and inspiration as well as more academic research as well. So we'll start off um, with Adam Bennett, who's an artist and who's um, kindly sharing his work with us um, on common ground um, and thinking about um, his own views about the commons. So I'm very pleased and excited about um, Adam's presentation. Then we'll have um, Mark, um, talking about Epping Forest and his work on um, looking at the commons preservation movement in relation to that. Then we'll have a um, quick break for questions then. And then we'll have three speakers talking about um, trespass and commemorating trespass. Um, so I'll start with um, welcoming Adam um, and his presentation. Great, thank you very much. One second. Can you see my screen? Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Firstly, I just want to say thank you to Katrina and the Museum of English Rural Life for inviting me to speak today about my work. Um, my name's Adam Bennett and I'm a photographer and current MA student studying documentary photography at the University of South Wales. Um, I work primarily with medium of landscape photography to explore the relationship between land use, ecology and notions of heritage. And my current um, project, Common Ground, is an exploration of common land in England in relation to their ecological value. So I'll give you a little bit of background about the project to begin with. So historically, approximately 22% of the English landscape was enclosed through a number of enclosure awards, and it reduced the percentage of common land in the present day to approximately 3% in England. Um, WJT Mitchell described this as an internal colonization of the home country and a transformation from what William Blake called the green and pleasant land into a landscape, an emblem of national and imperial identity. So he suggests that it was a simultaneous movement of enclosure, but at the same time through art, depicting the English landscape as natural and a place of peace and harmony when the reality was becoming quite different. Derek Wall highlights that enclosure is associated with the degradation of the environment historically, but also in the present. So at the time, enclosures were deemed an economic necessity, um, but didn't consider the ecological impact of the transformation of land through agricultural improvements and the reduction of space for wildlife to flourish. So how does that play out today? So there are currently over 7,000 pieces of registered common land in England, and of the 3% of registered common land, an astonishing 88% carry one or more national statutory conservation designations, such as national parks, areas of outstanding national beauty, Ramsar sites, etc. And 57% are registered as sites of special scientific interest, which is a designation given to places that um, contain rare species of fauna or flora. So if we consider that over half of registered common land holds this SSSI designation, in comparison to just 7% of the overall English land surface, it highlights the significance of the commons for ecological value in the present day. So that's where the project lies in exploring those places. So I'll go on to show you a few of the images and talk about those. So this is um, Cleve Common. It's just outside of Cheltenham in Gloucestershire. It's one of the most extensive areas of limestone grassland in the Cotswolds. And it's um, designated as an SSSI for both its geological and biological features. A number of rare species of plants grow within the common, 
one of which is the purple milk vetch, an endangered species which has declined mostly due to the destruction of habitats through agricultural improvement and non-sustainable grazing. This is um, brown moss, which is located just outside of Whitchurch in my home county of North Shropshire. So it's a peat bog and biologically important for containing over 200 species of wildflower, including one of the country's most rare plants, the floating water plantain. Um, this is uh, gossamore in mid Cornwall, so it forms part of the mid Cornwall moors SSSI. It's a similar theme again, so um, plants can be found here, uh, rare, rare species of plants can be found here. The lesser water plantain, the chaffweed, lesser butterfly orchid, along with nationally scarce mollusk beetles and butterflies. What interested me a lot though is that um, the commons don't offer such significantly biological spaces only in predominantly rural areas. So this photograph is taken at Esher Common in Surrey. So it's within the bounds of the M25. Could be considered that it's in a much more urban area than the others that I've visited. Yet um, within the common of critically endangered plants, the star fruit has been found in recent years. So I'll take you through a few more photographs from the project. This is Drig Sand Dunes in Cumbria. And this is um, an ancient woodland, so following on from the discussions, discussions earlier. This is in Gloucestershire, located just outside of Hawkesbury. It's called Lower Woods. This one is taken just outside of Oakhampton in Dartmoor National Park. This is Yateley Common. It's in Hampshire, just outside of Farnborough. and Lug Meadow, which is near Hereford in Herefordshire. So it's in these spaces of rich ecological value that I hope in the near future that we can come to associate as emblems of our national identity, those where humans and the environment can coexist, rather than the wider perspective, which is inclusive of the homogenous agricultural landscape. Thank you for listening. That's all I've got, thanks. I don't know how to stop sharing there. Hang on. There we go, thank you. Super, thank you, Adam. Those are absolutely stunning photographs and um, the variety as well is interesting in terms of looking at the variety of when people think of the word common and common ground and actually you've shown just with your beautiful photographs that variety is um, something that I don't think people often appreciate actually in terms of um, ecological as well as topographical variety. Um, Tom from the Mills put Adam's website address in the chat so you can see more of Adam's work on adam-bennett.com. Okay, well, We'll take questions, if there's any specific questions for Adam, we'll take them after Mark's paper, so you've got some time to think them through. Um, so I'll also now welcome um, Mark Gorman from Newman Heritage and um, talking about Commons Preservation and East London. Thanks very much, uh, Katrina. Yeah, they, they were stunning photos, weren't they? Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the theme of the book I just published called Saving the People's Forest. Um, 
which looks at uh, the campaign to save not only Epping Forest from uh, development, but also other um, urban and peri-urban commons around London in the mid-Victorian period. And, um, and this year, 2021, sees a number of anniversaries, key moments in the history of preserving open spaces. Um, we're going to be hearing about win the Winter Hill Trespass, which I know very little about, but want to be very interested to hear more. And also in London, the uh, passing um, 150 years ago of the of Acts of Parliament to preserve to safeguard Wanstead, uh, Wandsworth Common, sorry, and Hampstead Heath from development. And also 150 years ago this summer was another um, event which is largely forgotten now, but was a watershed moment in one of the earliest campaigns to save open spaces in this country from development. So on the 8th of July, 1871, a demonstration of East Londoners took place on the edge of Epping Forest, northeast of London. Um, and events that day and subsequently helped to launch a protest campaign to save Epping Forest, which lasted for most of the 1870s and culminated in the passing of the 1878 Epping Forest Act. And the great environmental historian Oliver Rackham um, has described this campaign as the beginning of the modern British conservation movement, which is a big claim, but I think is, is substantially true. Um, the meeting that was advertised by this poster you can see on the screen here was to protest against the fencing off a section of a section of uh, wanted flats, which is a large, which was and is still a large common open space on the southern edge of Epping Forest. Um, Epping Forest, for those who don't know it, um, uh, comes down from rural, well, semi-rural Epping now into um, very urban northeast London. Um, but in the 1870s, it was still um, on London's fringes. But the fences that had been put up on the uh, on the common, which uh, the, the protesters were um, uh, demonstrating against, had been put up by the Lord of Wanstead Manor, by Count Cowley, who claimed, as did so many uh, lords of the manor in the London area, that um, he had the right uh, to do so as the uh, landowner. Um, but uh, thousands of Londoners who'd long seen Epping Forest as their open space for leisure and recreation strongly disagreed with him. And this meeting advertised here was called by um, a group of elite campaigners, gentlemen campaigners really, many of whom were members of the Commons Preservation Society. Um, and in their speeches in the meeting, they urged the crowd um, to demonstrate, but demonstrate peacefully and lawfully and not to damage the fences. Um, the uh, campaign leaders then withdrew and went home, um, as did the police, in fact. Um, and at that point, um, the uh, uh, crowd literally took matters into their own hands and broke Lord Cowley's fences to Matchwood. Um, so the demonstrators were there that day because, as I say, for centuries, London has joined, enjoyed the open country beyond their crowded streets and felt it was their own. But London, of course, is growing. Um, the trickle of development became a flood from the mid 1850s um, and it became more and more urgent to save what was left. And, and uh, landowners like Cowley were clearly interested in, um, in fencing off space and initially for farmland, but they soon saw the opportunity for um, housing development. So the usual story told of the rescue of London open spaces is that of middle-class campaigners, um, people like Octavia Hill and Robert Hunter, who Katrina mentioned earlier, featured in um, OSS photographs, uh, who went on to found the National Trust, having been leading campaigners in the Commons Preservation Society from the mid 1860s. And it's their accounts that uh, many historians draw on um, to, uh, to describe these campaigns. Much less known is the story of ordinary Londoners and their part in the um, saving of London's open spaces. Um, they also had good reason um, to want to defend what was called London's lungs in that sort of cliched phrase that newspapers loved in the 19th century, well, still love today. Um, not only on bank holidays, but also weekends, um, as weekends became freer for working people in London, 
Um, open spaces were host to thousands of Londoners, sometimes tens of thousands. And um, to cater for this, these um, new uh, leisure seekers, um, urban parks began to be developed, Finsbury Park in North London and Victoria Park in East London. But these were highly regulated spaces with fences and what one newspaper has described as stiff beetles um, to keep the humbler classes in order. And it was open spaces like the London Commons, which were attractive because they were not managed. And Epping Forest being just beyond the Metropolitan Police District was one in particular, um, which, host, which saw thousands of visitors. Um, there were famous uh, events in the forest like the Fairlock Fair and the Easter Hunt at Epping, um, which attracted uh, Londoners to, um, to visit the forest. So, and Epping Forest became symbolic of many issues at the time. Much loved and heavily used open space, threatened by building development, and also by aristocratic landowners like um, uh, Lord Cowley at, uh, at Wanstead. Um, and these local landowners became the target of a great deal of hostility. Uh, anybody who reads the popular press of the 1870s, like Reynolds newspaper or um, Lloyd's uh, Weekly, will see um, excoriating descriptions of local landowners, um, oppressive, tyrannical, selfish, rapacious, um, uh, and that was that was just uh, the beginning of it. Um, so uh, that's why this huge crowd came together on Wanstead Flats, and that is why um, after the 8th of July, a local campaign group, the Forest Fund, was set up in East London, made up some, of some um, CPS, Commons Preservation Society members, but also of many ordinary East Londoners, um, particularly um, radical, uh, political rad radicals, some who had a history from the Chartist movement, and they hold um, um, open space tradition of, of campaigning and demonstrating um, on public spaces. Uh, that, the, that the Chartists had upheld. So during the 1870s, um, the campaign gathered force um, and it was certainly led by um, elite aristocratic and, and gentlemen and uh, women leaders like um, Octavia Hill and uh, Robert Hunter. But it was also um, spurred on by petitioning public meetings, open air meetings held in the, on uh, land like Epping Forest and other open spaces. Uh, Hackney Downs saw um, a number of riots in the mid 1870s. Uh, Plumstead famously had a three day riot um, in 1876 um, uh, against enclosure. And it was, it was this context of uh, ferment and popular protest, which I argue um, uh, had a material effect, material impact on the uh, legal and parliamentary action that was taken during the 1870s. In East London, it's interesting that um, in the, for example, in the 1874 election campaign in East London, no candidate uh, failed to stand up and say uh, that they, they were uh, defending uh, all open spaces and particularly Epping Forest. The one candidate who was thought not to have done that sufficiently strongly um, Acton Ayrton in Tower Hamlets paid heavily uh, that he paid the price by, uh, by being defeated by, for the first time, a Conservative candidate in an East London constituency. Um, so I, want, I just wanted to really put down the marker for um, this campaign and also for the, the wider um, involvement of uh, ordinary people um, in uh, campaigning for uh, their open spaces and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that uh, in the in the presentations coming up. Um, just to, to finish, um, although the 1878 Epping Forest Act um, preserved the forest from development and gave the City of London the responsibility of preserving it unbuilt upon and unencroached upon forever, um, nevertheless even up to today um, camp uh, campaigns have to continue to stop the sort of nibbling away at the edges of the forest. Indeed, in, um, in the post-war period, uh, two local councils in East London attempted to build on the southern part of the forest on Wanstead Flats. 
and, and evoked another huge popular campaign. And I just want to finish with the words from that campaign leaflet in 1946, a campaign that started locally in East London, but went national. Um, and this leaflet said this uh, of, of, the develop, of the proposed development. Once done, it can never be undone. And future generations will condemn the folly of the those who allowed it to happen. Um, a message from history for today, I think. Thank you. Super, thanks, Mark. Um, that's great. So um, we've got a couple of minutes for, for questions for both Mark and Adam. Um, I'll just summarise what's going on in the chat. So there's, again, we're getting a whole bibliography being compiled um, in the chat. Um, Ollie from the Mill has advertised that um, the museum has got an exhibition on commons re-enchanting the world and a project which fits very nicely with um, Adam's emphasis in, in his photographs um, and there are some links up in the chat for that. Um, there's um, a conversation about um, the CPRE and Englishness and, and, and suburbia going on. But I think what's coming through both from Adam's photographs and from Mark's description of the Epping Forest campaign, again, is this, um, it's something that I've been working on quite a lot in my new work. In um, one of the questions that I'm asking is, you know, what are the commons? What are, who are commoners? And um, actually we've, Helen, Neve has, has um, succinctly described it as owners v commoners v recreationers. And that seems to be a tension that goes on um, from the start of the commons preservation movement in the 1860s onwards, which is who, who has the right to use these spaces? Is it people with common rights who are quite often location specific, um, who have rights attached to a property or descended or bought? their rights or is it a matter of public access and what you find from the 1860s onwards is that the idea of the right to roam that we'll we'll hear about in a second um, sometimes gets merged with this other idea is about what commons are um, and co the older idea of commons as commons as profits of prandra things that you take from the land um, start to get sort of confused in people's minds. Um, and we also have the other issue, which I don't think really comes into it until the 20th century, which, which is the ecology aspect of, are we preserving a space to get rid of humans interfering in the space? And should we, what should we do with nature? And I guess current debates about what rewilding or renaturing should mean um, fit into that as well. Um, so um, we've always had tensions in what we preserve in the commons. Are we preserving livelihoods? Are we preserving property prices? Are we preserving the right to roam or, or, or reclaiming the right to roam? All these themes um, have always been there since at least the 1860s. Perhaps the 1820s are when the first footpath societies um, are formed. So um, all these themes are always the way through and also class. And I think in Mark's work, certainly you, you've got those tensions in terms of, is it, you know, working class people defending their right to have a bank holiday day out or is it um, middle class people wanting a nice, um, you know, leisurely week away? Um, okay, has anyone got any questions? Got Keith waving. <laughs> Oh, I'm suddenly big on the screen, I must be. Okay, um, two, two fine papers, thank you very much. Uh, my question's for Adam, but it sort of bounces off Mark's paper in some ways, in the sense that you started your talk, which is fascinating, absolutely amazing pictures, with sort of talking about how few commons are left, and we always sort of think about how they were lost. And But my question is, why did some of them survive? How did some of them survive? They weren't all defended by the working class populations that the, or the urban ones were. So do, do you have any insight into what sort of how those lovely places you photographed actually remained as commons and didn't get privatised to for, you know, the emerging agricultural industry, etc? Yeah, thanks, Keith. Um, 
I've done some research into some specific sites. Um, so the picture I showed of Lower Woods in Gloucester, Gloucestershire. Um, so that's the ancient woodland. And I spoke to the, um, I think the guy from the Wildlife Trust that was um, working there. And he had lots of history about the place. And he said that basically it, it, it wasn't used agriculturally due to the, the, um, the ground surface. So it's very muddy. Um, it just it just wasn't suitable for agricultural purposes at all. Um, but also other images that I showed, um, such as the more alpine images, obviously they're they're high up. Some of them are shot, you know, at mountains. So in terms of agriculture and things, they just it just wouldn't we wouldn't work. So it's luck as much as anything, probably. Just be quite nice to sort of bring that together somewhere sometime. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks very much. No <laughs> yes. And that links with Jeremy's point in the chat, which is he says that owners of commons often can't turn their um, commons to ad economic advantage because it would actually cost too much to, to maintain. Um, and again, it, it, what strikes me looking at commons and what strikes me from Adam's photographs is, again, it's, it's so site specific. It, it depends very much on... Um, the natural environment, the ecology, but also um, the, the history of land ownership, um, what benefits that. And, and um, there's, again, always that tension between what a common land is in terms of how it's used and then its exchange value and its economic value. Um, and you see that, again, in, in the history of commons preservation and what gets preserved and what doesn't is often very historically and time specific. Mm. Um, there's lots and lots of chat. We could write a whole book with the chat. Jeremy's got his hand up. So do you want to respond to that, Jeremy? Yeah, no, I just, I mean, these are, I think what you were saying, Katrina, about how local this is. And I mean, that's one of the really wonderful things about commons, isn't it? That, um, you know, I mean, thinking right back to kind of E.P. Thompson and customs in common, that it's very much about local custom and the kind of intersection of these different kind of customs um, and the kind of, local politics local economics local kind of geology even all these things kind of make it make it different everywhere and there was a really fascinating example that i looked at a few years ago now it's bucklebury common um in um it's a really big common in um in berkshire west berkshire um and, and there was just exactly one of those kind of sort of um in a way three-cornered kind of fights over it um in the in the early 20th century um and I think it was that the local district council wanted to kind of um, uh, preserve it. Put I can't quite remember exactly what the legislation they were proposing was. But there were some regulations they were proposing to introduce, which would have made it, which would have tidied it up um, uh, and made it look kind of, in many ways, rather like a sort of urban park. It was going to have kind of, I think, water fountains and kind of benches and all kinds of nice amenities. And this outraged the kind of people who had the common rights, the, the sort of um, uh, who were mainly kind of small farmers, that sort of people in, in Bucklebury. Um, uh, but it's a more complex picture than you might initially imagine, because partly what the kind of um, commoners were angry about is that they weren't going to be allowed to dump rubbish on the common um, anymore, um, which actually was much, much cheaper for them than having to pay the local authority to take the rubbish away. Um, so you know, the nice tidy story we might like to tell about how the good commoners were kind of fighting to prevent the kind of um, destruction of the, of, of the common is, 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 is a bit more complex. And then just to add to the kind of ironies, what actually eventually happened is that just before the Second World War, um, the, a far more powerful player moved in and took over, and that was the army, um, which decided it wanted the land for military, I think it was a big kind of um, military equipment kind of depot and they completely wrecked it um, and it actually hasn't recovered since. So, you know, all these all these many different kind of intersecting kind of interests. And it's it's not necessarily a simple story of you know, goodies and baddies or anything like that. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm conscious of the people who've got their hands up, but I'm also conscious of time. So um, if you can keep typing in the chat, maybe with your, your comments, I've got, I, I want to make sure we've got our, our mass trespass people have got time to um, 
do their bits. And if you haven't had a question or been able to ask a question, you're feeling a bit nervous or scary about it. If you're new to this kind of thing, you know, do try um, and say something in the chat at least, because we want to hear um, a variety of views. So um, next we have um, Dave Toff um, talking about the Hayfield um, Kinder Trespass. And um, got this slide up. <clears throat> David, I'm afraid you're on mute, so you're going to have to. Um, unmute and start again <laughs> you'd probably prefer it on mute actually right sorry about that yeah i'd like to start saying uh, thanks to adam and mark uh, mark i used to live on tony road which borders um wanstead flats and i, I wasn't aware of that history so uh, i found that fascinating um there are lots of anniversaries. We had a wonderful day at 125, which Chris will be telling you about in a minute, of the, uh, the Winter Hill uh, trespass in 1896. And next year is the 90th anniversary of one of those events which has become uh, an iconic event in the real sense of the word for the um, uh, campaign for access. It was actually, I think, the first time that the slogan Right to Rome had actually been used as a campaigning slogan. And that's on the weekend of the 23rd and 24th of April next year here in Hayfield. There'll be lots of information about that going out and it promises to be a very big event on both days. Uh, but these events, they're not just heritage events, I think that's really important. They are important in our political heritage of people uh, fighting for access. I disagree, actually. I think it mainly is goodies and baddies. Um, but, <laughs> you know, we can nuance things if we want. But uh, on the whole, it's been about goodies and baddies. And um, they're only what they are. They are important political way marks in a struggle that's still continuing and i think that's one of the things in lockdown for instance uh we've seen a, you know the importance it's promoted the importance of open spaces but it's also uh very much uh brought to the fore some of the tensions that these open spaces whatever they are are still very much contested spaces and we had the ironic uh, events at the beginning of lockdown of Derbyshire Constabulary, Derbyshire, the county of the uh, trespass, uh, using drones to film people perfectly legally walking on the open moors. And we've had tensions between so locals and people, incomers that have been brought to the fore and so on. But also, we must remember that we are not, we are still in this struggle for access. Kate Ashbrook, who I think is on somewhere, isn't she, um, reminded us on Sunday that uh, the police bill at the moment is about to criminalise trespass or certain elements of it. And I've heard it defended by a Tory MP who said that um, actually ramblers don't need to worry about it. It's really aimed at travelling people. Well, that ought to send a chill down everybody's spines, actually. Uh, and this thin end of the wedge, of course, affects all of us. So as this was in the poetry section, what I wanted to do was to read a poem which I think brings all of this together in lots of ways. It's, it's short, but it's in three phases. Uh, one, the sort of beauty of the open moors. Two, the struggle for access or get, regaining access. And thirdly, a warning against complacency. Sorry, I'll just have a drink there. Climbing kinder for the 1932 mass trespass. So these slopes here on the sides of this great and ancient plateau's edge, where the curlew sings on a summer's day, its solitary swooping note, like a crystal drop of kinder water, a song far sweeter than any music humans ever made, the walkers came to claim for all who'd follow the right to hear that song. 
to breathe that air with smog bruised lungs, to taste the sweetness of the open space, to pause a moment from the draining race of hard industrial existence. And they called those, tras those walkers trespassers, as if by claiming back these stolen treasures, as if by repossessing all these hard won pleasures, it was they who were the criminals. But when you climb up kinder now and feel your legs strain hard against the earth and fill your lungs with fresh free air and watch the long white hair kicking its legs in the very ecstasy of life, remember there are those who would have kept this from us and those who even now would, if they could, keep us from the silver stream and open moor and windswept wood. The struggle very much continues. Thanks for that. Thank you, David. Yeah. That was super. We pass straight on to Chris to talk about one to one two five. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm just going to share screen with my PowerPoint. So, okay. So I thought that uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, about the uh, the Wind Hill Trespass, and then I'll whiz through some pictures that uh, were taken on the event on on Sunday, which was absolutely amazing. So uh, yeah, Wind Hill Trespass happened in 1896 when um, Colonel Ainsworth, a local landowner, decided he'd shut the moor for the grouse shooting, and um, the Local radicals decided that they would uh, do something about this and organize uh, a group of people to march out of the town. So the, the Winter Hill is about five miles from the town center. And they walked through the residential districts uh, leading out of Bolton, about 200 strong at the start. By the time they got to the top of Halliwell Road, about a mile further on, they were 10,000 strong. People come out, these were, would all have been the, the houses uh, around this area, but they all, would all have been uh, mill employers, maybe coal miners, because there were, there were mines up in the moors. And they marched on up to, uh, to the, what's now called the disputed gate. And the picture you can see there is a stone that we had laid in 19, 1996 at the, uh, the centenary to, to commemorate the event. Uh, they stormed over the gamekeepers that Colonel Ainsworth, uh, Ainsworth had, had put in place. A few of them ended up in uh, brooks and, and drainage ditches. And um, but on, on the whole, it wasn't particularly violent. And went up onto the moor, walked over into the village of Belmont and drunk the pubs dry. Um, that, that continued for about three weeks, the, the, these demonstrations, despite the injunctions that uh, Colonel Ainsworth uh, brought, brought against the, the, the ringleaders. Um, eventually, uh, he prevailed. Um, the uh, ringleaders were taken to court. They were heavily fined, despite being represented by Richard Pankhurst, the uh, husband of uh, Emmeline. Um, but they, they were intrepid characters, and uh, the wonderfully named Josie Shufflebotham was one of, uh, a local radical firebrand. Uh, a guy called Solomon Partington, who was uh, a local journalist, actually, for two decades, he pursued Ainsworth over this. He never, never, never let it go. Um, it, got, it, it became forgotten over the years, but actually this was right at the very beginning of the battle for access. And as Dave, Dave would tell you, Dave Tuck will tell you, there was a, a direct link between this trespass, the snake trespass, snake, sorry, snake path trespass, a couple of years later, and the more famous Kinder trespass in, in 1932. There's a direct link going all through those. And it probably couldn't have happened anywhere else other than the northwest of England, because you know that's that's the, the birthplace of the uh, industrial revolution and the industrial working class. And uh, by 1896, Bolton, the people in Bolton, which is about 12 miles north of Manchester, had had been through a very tough time during the American Civil War. There was the embargo on the export of cotton by the Union forces. There was at, people were starving in Bolton. Uh, the, the Great Depression of the, of the late 80s and, and early 90s uh, brought about you know, a whole political maelstrom. People were, were, were 
getting involved with working class organizations and trade unions were flourishing. Uh, radical movements like the Social Democratic Federation, the Independent Labour Party were formed. Uh, the suffrage movement was flourishing. And out of this whole maelstrom, you know, uh, actually Bolton Socialist Club was formed, uh, of which I'm chair, and which is still in the same building that they put, we purchased in 1905. Um, and that's where Joe Shufflebotham actually was a regular uh, there. And uh, he, uh, obviously, before, before it was in, in his present location, but the impulse for this trespass in 1896 came from that group of people. Um, and, and, and it really had to happen somewhere, in, you know, in that part of the world. Um, it, uh, it still is very, a very important uh, event in, in, in Bolton's history since it's been rediscovered by local historian Paul Salveson in the 80s. He's written a little booklet about it. Um, and it's captured people's imagination. It, it was first celebrated in, in, in about 82, 1982, then at the centenary in 96, and, and obviously last Sunday, in, uh, which was the 125th anniversary. And I think, I, I just think there's a number of reasons for this, uh, why it's so captured uh, people's imaginations. I'm just gonna flick through some of these slides to give you a feeling of, uh, of what, what it was like on Sunday. This banner you can see was we, we commissioned that from a, a local artist. Um, we invited speakers, so Kate, Kate was speaking and reminded us as Dave said, these, these are not just heritage events, these are very, very important events uh, in, in the battle for access. Guy Shrubs all come up and, and, and spoke and our, our, our uh, local mayor spoke. And so that got us to a rousing start. We wanted to involve the community as much as we could. We leafleted this entire area to make people aware of what was going on. You can see it's very much a residential area. Um, and we marched up Halliwell Road in exactly the same routes as before. We, the, 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 the Samba Band is the PCS Samba Band who did a sterling job. This guy, you can just see his leg, and he walked most of that first mile backwards. Uh, which was some event, and people came out and, and watched this. You can see them there uh, on the doorsteps that were very much uh, clapping and joining in and so forth. And it, and it was a terrific event, which is what we want it to be. Um, this is us coming up, up the hill to, to, towards the, uh, the moorland. That's the Socialist Club banner. And that's us now going up onto Winter Hill which uh, the top of Winter Hill is not that lovely because it's, uh, uh, as you can see from the mast, it's telecommunications and a hub. Uh, that's a, an enormous TV mast, but it is loved. People love it up there and it, it is in the blood of, I mean, you can tell from my accent, I'm not local to Bolton, but it, it's very much uh, something we're, we're kind of proud of. Um, and I just want to show you through some of the banners that give you, you know, the way that people projected onto this event. And I think it had something to do first with the great weather, we were blessed, uh, but also uh, COVID, the fact that we've been confined, people looking for something to celebrate. And I think they want, they kind of projected their contemporary uh, concerns with the world and so on onto this event because it gave them a canvas to do so. So I'll just throw a sample of some of the banners. This is the local uh, trade uh, unison branch, so and they supported the the, the, the event financially. Extinction Rebellion, uh, a local group from just up the road in Preston, the, the, who also contributed to this uh, struggle with, back in the day. These are the uh, anti fracking uh, people. This is a, a local community group that uh, actually is. A, attached to the local housing provider. They wanted to do some work to support this and they, they, they had, we had a, an artist to, to work with introduce these banners and join in the walk. Uh, and obviously people bringing the, their concerns, kill the bill, the climate emergency, because it, they felt, and we had this wonderful group of craftivists who were cross section of people who wanted to contribute in another way. So they brought these wonderful little uh, dolls and banners, and I, obviously I'm reminded of um, the granny, uh, the anti-nuclear in, uh, I've forgotten the name. Uh, 
and these are, these are the clarion choir members uh, who were singing as we as we came by. Uh, there was a low uh, the the hall where uh, Ainsworth used to live, which is now uh, owned by the local council. There was a little exhibition of photographs and um, oral history and written history. And of course, that's that's really what it's all about. That view from up the top, where you get that freedom. In, back in the day, from um, from the smog that sat down in the valley, and today, just to enjoy the view. I think just to just to link back to what other people have been saying. Back in 1896, I guess the vast majority of those those marches would have been working class people from the mills and the mines. Uh, I've not done a survey, but I would imagine that majority uh, this time round, and we had over a thousand people on the march, um, were probably from more middle class backgrounds, and there's that, which I think is an interesting uh, thing. So it was a great day. Uh, it was great optimism, great air of celebration. I think just to reinforce that idea that these are not just celebrations of some historical event, we had to uh, we had a, an offer. From a local quarry company who are busy uh, eating away at the morph at the other side, uh, also blocking rights away and also flouting local planning laws to fund a, a new memorial to the to the uh, trespass up on the top, uh, which we declined for rather obvious reasons. Uh, so there is a danger in there, you know, that these celebrations. Uh, get taken over by some sort of euphoria and the, the real purpose of them, as Kate was keen to remind us when she spoke on the day, this is to get people out and fighting to defend access to these spaces. Thanks. Thanks so much, Chris. That was a wonderful um, account of a wonderful day. Um, and actually, so many people in the chat have, were there, so it's good that um, hopefully it brings back some nice memories too, um, and also reminds us of the purpose. Um, so our final speaker in this session is Keith, who's um, talking about the 1991 trespass, and then we'll take some discussion after that. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me first of all, and can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Uh, excellent. I'll start the uh, slideshow. Uh, so uh, my name is Keith Sands. Uh, I'm not an academic. Uh, I work in publishing. Um, I'm also a rock climber um, with an interest in climbing history and uh, climbing literature. Uh, and this talk is based on some research I did earlier this year in the lockdown uh, when I couldn't go climbing, uh, when I interviewed some of the participants in the Range West uh, Mass Trespass. Um, it's a little known uh, trespass compared with Kinder Scout and uh, Winter Hill, uh, but I think it deserves to be uh, better known. Um, it took place in the southwest corner of Wales uh, in the Castle Martin area of Pembrokeshire on what's now Ministry of Defence land. Uh, and it became such in the military enclosures, uh, if you want to call them that, of the 20th century. Um, the Castle Martin armoured vehicle firing ranges uh, were created in 1938 uh, after the War Office requisitioned land from the Stackpole estate. Uh, tenant farmers were evicted with little compensation and had to find... <laughs> um, so uh, tenant farmers uh, were evicted with little compensation. Um, during the war, it was used for tank training. It was farmed again uh, after the war until 1951 and then re-requisitioned. Um, and during the Korean War, uh, and it's been used for training of NATO forces um, since then. It's divided into two areas, Range East and Range West. Um, in Range East, there is access to the coastal path when firing's not taking place uh, and climbing's been tolerated on the cliffs there, uh, more or less, since the 1970s. Um, in Range West, it's a different story. The coastal path takes a long diversion inland uh, there's no access to the range without permission of the base, uh, whether or not firing is taking place. Uh, and there's a bylaw um, which uh, specifies fines, uh, which started at £5 in 1942 uh, and are now stand at £500. Uh, and the reason for that is that Range West, unlike Range East, is uh, used for the firing of live shells. Uh, and there are objects like this scattered all over the landscape and the cliff tops there, and some of them could potentially explode uh, if they're interfered with. 
Uh, on the other hand, though, Range West also happens to contain three or four miles of some of the, uh, the best limestone cliffs for rock climbing in the whole of the UK. And this is the heart of uh, what happened uh, in 1991. A few words about the culture of rock climbing uh, to set some of the context. Um, if it can be climbed, climbers will try and climb it, um, whatever it is and wherever it is. Uh, this means that trespassing and battles for access have always been a part of rock climbing in the UK and still are. Um, there's a dividing line between climbing as exploration uh, and climbing as sport. And the protagonists in this story are very much on the exploration side of that debate. Um, and a unique feature of rock climbing as a sport or pastime is that the climber who first leads a new line on a crag uh, gets the privilege of naming the routes. Uh, and the routes at Range West uh, tell uh, in quite an interesting way the story uh, of, of the, the mass trespass and the campaign around it. Um, Dave Cook uh, is the hero of this story. Um, he's the, the Benny Rothman of Range West, Benny Rothman being the organiser of the, the Kinder Scout Mass Trespass. Um, he was a charismatic uh, London-based political activist, uh, teacher, climber and writer. He was 50 years old at the time of the trespass. He had worked for the Communist Party of Great Britain and was a founder member of the Green Socialist Network. Um, he was firmly on the exploration side of climbing, going so far as to say that sport climbing is an imperialist pastime, which I think was slightly tongue in cheek. Um, he travelled to Australia by bike uh, and wrote a travel book called Breaking Loose, Loose, and he was the instigator of the Range West Mass Trespass. Um, sometime in 1983, uh, Dave Cook, uh, with his friend Pat Devine, um, hopped over the fence of Range West, ignoring the signs, and found a path down to a tidal ledge uh, with an intimidating overhanging cliff. Uh, they found a line of weakness at the side of this cliff and put up a new route uh, there. They thought it was the first route ever climbed in the range, um, although in fact a few routes had been climbed with the permission uh, of the uh, military in the 1970s by Jim Perrin and others. Uh, they called their route Range Free, uh, and decided to name the cliff itself Greenham Common uh, in honour of the uh, women's peace camp that was taking place uh, at the airbase at the time. And after this, they simply began talking to other climbers and encouraging them to go in and trespass uh, to climb at Range West. And over several years, this trickle of climbers uh, gradually increased, and there was a core of climbers from Bristol, Manchester, Chester, London and Cardiff, who would regularly meet in Pembroke and trespass to climb in the range. Um, the sheer excitement of having these uh, bloody miles of new cliff to explore, which is a very rare thing in the UK, uh, as Bob Allen said, uh, was too much to resist. Um, Paul Donithorne and Bob Allen both said um, the climbers at the time were like kids in a sweet shop. Trespassers would often climb all day without interruption, uh, but were sometimes told to leave and escorted off the range by patrols of military police. Uh, and sometime in the 1980s, uh, another colonel, actually, after Winter Hills, Colonel Ainsworth entered the scene. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Portman was the commandant, the new commandant of the base and decided to crack down on rock climbing. Um, and the number of patrols increased over time. In August 1991, things seemed to come to a bit of a head. Um, Paul Donathorne and Emma Alsford, local climbers, um, were caught after their two lurchers tied up at the top of the, their abseil route, chewed through their ropes, and went off chasing rabbits, um, which gave away the position of the climbers. Uh, a whole fleet of Land Rovers were called to escort them off the range, and they were told a helicopter was on the way, as they were believed to be smugglers. Uh, and they called their route Air Raid as a result. Um, around this time, August 1991, conversations in the St Govans in amongst climbers turned to how to bring things to a head and push the issue of access to Range West to a wider climbing public. And Dave Cook suggested that a mass trespass along the lines of Kinder Scout was the way to do it. Um, and this was a very popular idea. A date was fixed, uh, Sunday the 20th of October for the trespass. And this was spread by word of mouth uh, via informal networks of climbers uh, and the Climbers Club. Uh, in fact, several groups of climbers found each other in the pub uh, on the Friday and about 20 people went in on the Saturday. So the trespass was really the whole weekend. Um, but the main confrontation with the authorities took place uh, on the Sunday. 
And there's some nice photos of the event, which have been provided by uh, David Barlow, uh, one of the trespassers, and Ivan Coleman, um, who's David, Dave Cook's stepson, um, who was a photographer who was accompanying the trespassers uh, at the time. Uh, and this is the area of Green and Common uh, on the day of the trespass. About 50 climbers took part in the trespass uh, on the Sunday, uh, many of them setting out about six in the morning from May Cottage, which belonged to the Climbers Club. Um, car headlights were switched off as they went past the base guardhouse. Um, they gathered at the car park at Stack Rocks. Uh, Dave Co Cook gave a speech uh, setting the ground rules. If asked to leave, don't get into an altercation. Uh, don't run away. Allow yourself to be escorted off, but make it clear that this is a protest. Um, and a journalist and photographer for The Independent uh, were accompanying uh, as well. Uh, the bulk of the climbers went to Greenham Common uh, and a number of smaller groups also found out to other sections of the coast like Penny Holt Bay uh, to try their luck at finding new routes. Uh, climbing was underway at Greenham Common when the authorities turned up about half past 10 in the morning. Uh, a uniformed guard appeared at the top of the cliff and shouted uh, down to the climbers that they weren't supposed to be there, uh, whereupon they said, yeah, we, we know that. Uh, but climbers after finishing routes began to be escorted off the range uh, but the patrols quickly realised they were not just dealing with the, you know, the few usual suspects that they had seen before uh, and that something much bigger uh, was underway. Uh, climbers at Greenham Common who were, who, who were told to head back to the car park and started heading back into the range uh, were challenged with the shouts of are you daft as well as deaf, uh, which immediately got repurposed as a route name uh, the same day. Um, as the day went on, uh, more and more climbers were discovered in different locations and Colonel Portman himself got involved, he, having been alerted uh, by his patrols and also a journalist from The Guardian phoning him up. Um, he asked uh, military police to begin detaining the climbers uh, rather than just escorting them off the range. Some climbers were happy to be detained in this way. Others played an entertaining game of cat and mouse, popping their heads over the tops of cliffs and, and shouting over here, mate, or ducking out of sight in the turf and crawling towards the fence. Um, Dave Cook himself is uh, pictured here having a lively debate uh, with uh, military police uh, in a Land Rover. David Barlow's group uh, at Penny Holt Bay was one of the later groups to be actually detained. Um, the military police couldn't arrest civilians, so they uh, summoned the Pembrokeshire Constabulary, who seemed strangely reluctant to, to, to attend. Eventually, they sent uh, a single patrol car to the Stack Rocks car park. Colonel Portman himself then turned up in a visible rage uh, and practically dragged a police officer out of the car with a demand that all the climbers be immediately arrested and taken to the cells in Pembroke. Uh, and then there was an embarrassing standoff when the police said they couldn't actually do that as tris trespass was uh, a civil offence uh, and the climbers had actually cooperated um, with the military police who'd escorted them off. The colonel and the police then walked out of earshot to the notice board to consult the bylaws themselves uh, and eventually uh, an agreement was reached that the police would take the names and addresses of the detained climbers with a view to future prosecution and that was that for the day. Uh, in the aftermath of the trespass, uh, it was written up in the Guardian in Independent. Uh, the former carried a quote from Colonel Portman that the climbers were cowboys and spoilt children, which again immediately became a root name on Range West. Uh, David Barlow and his group uh, got letters from the Pembrokeshire police uh, three months later to say they would not be pressing charges with the caution, I trust you will be more careful in the future, which was really interpreted as don't get caught. Uh, trespassing continued uh, at the range uh, over Christmas, about 60 new routes were added by a small group uh, when the patrols uh, weren't, weren't around. Um, and the, M the MOD, under pressure now from the British Mountaineering Council, conceded that the only way to keep a lid on things and not to be held liable if someone blew themselves up accidentally was to agree to a limited and controlled access agreement. Climbers would have to attend an annual briefing warning them of the dangers of unexploded ordnance, sign a, sign a waiver, uh, so they wouldn't be on the MOD's insurance, um, hear about the nesting sites of choffs and agree to certain bans on certain routes, which climbers are always happy to do um, to protect wildlife. Uh, in the early years, the MOD used interminable briefings at inconvenient times of the year, sometimes three hours long, uh, to limit the numbers of climbers who would climb in range west. And this is something which they still do to some extent. Uh, and there's a subplot of military environmentalism here. Uh, firing ranges like range west do become wildlife havens. 
uh, and the MOD is quite keen on using the conservation argument uh, to keep control over these pristine environments so they can then blow things up in them. Um, Dave Cook uh, tragically died in 1983 uh, on another long distance cycle trip in Turkey. He was killed by a lorry. Um, hundreds of new routes uh, by the time of the 1996, uh, 1996 guidebook, which is a lovely publication, um, had been put up about 600, I think, in Range West. And in 2021, for the first time, the briefings went online, so you can now do it in three minutes. Uh, but access is still very much provisional and can be withdrawn at any time. More and more people have climbed there, um, including myself now. Um, after interviewing some of the trespassers, I, I was very fortunate to be invited on a 30-year reunion um, in June this year for a fantastic weekend of climbing at Range West. Um, and uh, one of the climbers here, Pat Devine, uh, was one of the original people to climb trespass in Range West uh, and is still climbing at the age of 84. Um, the route names uh, at Range West uh, commemorate uh, the antics of the trespassers, uh, as I've already uh, alluded. Uh, there's some lovely ones there if you look at the guidebook and many more than the ones I've listed here. Um, and they also have a few digs at the military authorities. Um, many of the climbers here who climb there now are actually unaware of why they're able to do so. Uh, and I think that the event deserves to be as well known to rock climbers as Kinder Scout is to hill walkers. Um, I've written an article um, which is in the uh, current issue of Climber magazine, um, September, October issue, which you can find online or in very large news agents. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in, in knowing more about it, uh, there's a full account uh, in there. And that's uh, the end of my talk. Super, thanks, Keith. Um, what fantastic photographs as well, really evocative, I think, of that. Um, we've got about three, three, four minutes for quick questions. Um, ben Anderson's had to leave, but he's recently been trained there as well and seems to share that experience of um, interminable training. Um, has anyone else got any questions or thoughts um, on any of the talks we've just heard from David's talk or Chris's talk or more on Adam or more on Keith's material. I can see that uh, someone mentioned Mariana Dudley of Bristol. I think that's about the only reference in any academic book to Range West I was able to find uh, in her book. Um, uh, but she, yeah, she, a couple of pages of her book on the MOD, the Environmental History of the MOD Estate, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, uh, it just tells, but in, very brief form uh, the, the the story of the uh, Range West trespass and mentions Dave Cook. Martin Pout's got a question. Are you a climber, Ben? Or... Me? No, no, I'm not a climber. All oh, right, okay. No, afraid not. Uh, well, I mean, I'm a walker, shall we say? I, okay. I wouldn't dare call myself. They, only, they only allow they only, only allow organised walks, don't they? Um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't going to make a comment about your, your presentation. It was about a previous one, if I may. Oh, right. Okay. Or in general. Uh, I wanted to ask whether you... Oh, sorry, um, I was, sorry. Oh, I was, I was, sorry, I was, I was commenting on a comment in the chat from Ben Anderson, who'd recently been to Range West. Sorry, I think there's a bit of cross-purposes there. Carry on, Martin. Yeah, I, I really wanted to ask a, a question, which is um, I, I've seen quite a lot of um, concern about the, uh, the, I think it's through the Ramblers, about um, mapping the, uh, the, the rights of way. And I wondered, Katrina, whether you could say, is the Open Society, um, Open Space Society involved in that in any way? Because it seems such an important um, activity. Yes, um, it's mainly been the Ramblers who've been organizing the official registration so you have to register by the deadline but the deadline's um, sort of looming um, in terms of making sure that rights away are registered um, otherwise um, if they go off the map then um, we'll lose them um, so it's mainly been led by the Ramblers Association but obviously it's, it's a concern for the Open Space Society and, and most of the um, countryside movement as generally in terms of rights of way Anyone want to say anything else about that? I'm just thinking because there are representatives of OSS here. 
think the final date is 2026, isn't it? There is yeah. a campaign to have that extended, in fact. Yeah, because there's just so many that actually people don't realise aren't registered. Oh. Um, Jack's here, he can talk about that. Jack, do you want to just quickly say something from the Ramblers? I'd just say really quickly, so I lead the campaign Don't Lose Your Way to find and claim historic rights of way before the 1st of January 2026. And there's, there's definitely volunteers from the OSS working on that as well and the British Horse Society. Um, if you're interested in it, um, if you search Don't Lose Your Way in Ramblers, we've actually got a map published of potential lost rights of way across England and Wales. So you can go and explore what might be unrecorded in your area and, and how your access could be better. Cheers. But I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I've got Thanks very much. Thanks. One hand from Jay Batsleer, and then we'll we'll have a quick break. That, that's me. I'm Julian, and I'm a sometime rock climber. And I just really was sort of taken by Keith's, but well, by Keith and the, the trespassers generally. There is clearly a hidden and very important left wing influence in all of this. You know, there is a left, insofar as Dave Cook and Benny Rothman were both sort of Communist Party members, serious Communist Party members, I think that needs to be taken into account. And, you know, that, I hope that gets written into some of the histories. The other more whimsical point on that, however, is that I'd always taken the default activity of um, climbers to be anarchy rather than sort of organised mass trespassing. Climbers are to my mind, quintessential anarchists. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think the, the, the comedy, actually, of the events around Range West um, is really in the contrast of the anarchistic activities of the climbers. I mean, OK, they did organise a trespass, um, but um, and, and this sort of very straight down the line, inflexible approach of, of Colonel Portman, who was continually kind of embarrassed in local media and made a fool of himself. And actually, basically, after the mass trespass had clearly then got instructions from the MOD saying, basically, you're going to have to let them in in some form. Let's find a way of letting them in in a controlled way. Um, and then had to play along with it and actually got to know some of the climbers uh, uh, better afterwards. Um, uh, and yeah, th there was, a, there was a, a very interesting dynamic between those people, that sort of anarchistic mindset, and the military mindset. Right, I'm conscious of time and I know people have got their hands up, but if you could carry on your questions in the chat, um, we'll move on to the last activity. Um, which is our final location challenge. And this, um, I've got some instructions, so I will share my screen with the instructions um, and get back to you. I actually, before I do that, I'm taking chair's privilege. Um, actually in the Open Spaces Society, there is another mass, mass trespass um, photograph which is Sunnydale and Bradford which I'm actually looking at at the moment um, Bradford West Yorkshire um, which is on the grounds of um, the waterworks um, so that's another sort of area of research I don't have time to talk about it today but that's that is in the image collection um, but I'm just going to go to the instructions so the last part of today, if you can stay with us to um, see some of the rest of the images and help locate the slides. Um, what I've been trying to do is trying to locate as many as possible. So in the next 20 minutes before we wrap up, um, what I'd like you to do is um, I've put a link and I'll put it in the chat, um, my database of locations which you can access. And also the images are available on the OSS um, images website. And I also recommend you use the National Library of Scotland um, maps website for finding old OS maps. That's one of the main sources of um, historic location spotting that has been um, the most useful in the way I've been looking at it. And what you see when you get to the um, database is that there are some gaps in the latitude and longitude column 
of um, lantern slides that I have no idea where they are. So a barbed wire bad style. Um, so if you can um, find some of them um, that don't have a latitude and longitude um, listed, I'd be really, really grateful and it will contribute to the research. Um, how do you find a latitude and longitude? If you know where somewhere is, you found it in the National Library of Scotland Maps page, for example, you can find latitude and longitude by finding the equivalent page on Google Maps, for example, and then looking at the URL um, the website address tells you those numbers. And because we're in the UK, because we're in England, they normally start with 50 something and minus or 0 point something. Um, those are the numbers you're looking for. That's latitude, that's longitude. Um, so these are some of the things that I'd like help um, looking for. I'll put all these links in the chat. Um, for example, ancient oak. Where is that? I'll click on it. If you know where that is, I'd really love to know because there's no metadata there at all. Um, so, I'm going to share that. So this is the the site, and I'll put the um, all the the links in the chat. And if you can either put the latitude and longitude and the title of the image in the chat or just put them directly in the database, that'd be really good and really helpful. Um, so that's your task for the next 15 minutes. If you want to carry on um, discussion as well, please do. Um, that's what on, and then we'll we'll wrap up at 16:25. And let me know if you've got any problems, but I've just put the, oh, hang on. This is the link to the database and I'll put the list of images that I definitely don't have, or well, there's plenty more. This is your homework. Most of these don't um, have locations or any metadata at all. Um, someone's asking if the share slides will be shared afterwards. We're hoping to have most of the recording on the Mill um, YouTube channel, Abby, and um, I'll I'll do a summary on the on my blog of the the symposium with all the wonderful bibliographic links that everyone has put down we've got a whole bibliography of commons forests floods preservation here and all the links to all the current campaigns that are going on like winter 125 and the ramblers don't lose your way campaign as well And if anyone um, does find any of these locations or knows where they are, then you will win the accolade of being location spotter of the day. I'm afraid there's no um, physical prize or monetary prize, but you'll, you'll win our admiration. Some of these could be quite obvious, um, but I don't know 
all the places. Most of them are likely to be in the southeast of England because that's where the majority of the collection is. Um, but for example, I don't know where um, large stone and beamed house with a moat is, but that presumably is familiar to someone here. And thanks to the Open Spaces Society for putting all their images up on their website. Um, and as we've said already, that you can um, read about the collection on the Merle website and all the Open Spaces Society um, information and campaigns are also um, available from here as well. But we need to know where these places are Jeremy and Mark, I think that the large stone beamed house is Ichthamot, somewhere I need to go and visit or pronounce properly. Super, thank you. So Jeremy gets the gold star um, of, of praise at the moment. Another one I'm struggling to identify is this one, boarded house with topiary. Um, I think it's a post office, it says post office on it. Presumably, probably Surrey or Sussex, given the, the boarded vernacular. Another one that I can't find is this country house, but I'm wondering whether it's um, that the one identified previously that I can't pronounce, um, but from another angle. So if anyone can confirm that. Um, Katrina, mm -hmm. it's pronounced item moat. Item, thank you very much, Mel. <laughs> There's a parallel conversation going on about the question about um, the um, socialist and left wing groups involved in mass trespass and other um, activities. So do follow that on the chat if you're interested.
if any of you are in Hampshire, I've got another one which said, just says Ferry Hampshire, um, which I'll put in the chat um, if anyone can locate whereabouts that is. Jack's found one. If anyone is on my spreadsheet, um, the ones at the end, starting with M, are the ones that are the generic countryside images, which aren't um, labelled with any locations at all. So um, those are the ones that were the hardest to find. Most of them seemed, again, to be in Surrey or Kent. Um, but when you've got just a description such as people by lake by woodside, it becomes a bit difficult. Katrina, yeah. I think the Igum Moat one, I think the um, crenellated building is the same, is the back of the same building. Right. Um, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. Cheers. Doing, doing some Googling. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks ever so much, everyone. Hopefully you've now got a flavour of what the image collection is like of the lantern slides. Um, I will leave you that as homework. Um, didn't, don't think you can attend a symposium without any um, hard work to, to, to follow up with. Um, if anyone can find any of the other images that I haven't been able to locate, um, that, that would be super. Thanks already, you've already got you know, a couple of the images um, that I wasn't able to find. Um, Ollie's just put West Malling Waterfall again, that would make sense given that some of the other um, images are of that area. So thanks ever so much for everyone's patience on such a warm day um, and some fantastic contributions. So I'd really like to thank all our speakers. Thanks to Ruth, to Adam, Mark, David, Chris um, and Keith, um, to all the participants. Thanks so much to um, the Open Spaces Society 
um, particularly to Kate and Sarah and everyone here, and to all the people at the Museum of English Rural Life um, for helping organise this. Um, thanks to um, Tom and Danielle um, and Caroline for, for shepherding this um, event together um, and for brilliant contributions in the chat and in the questions. Um, I think we've we've written our own um, mini book in the in the in the chat about all these different themes that have come through today, um, particularly thinking about the Locality, I think, has come through very strongly. The variety of commons and people's uses of the commons and how uses are requisitioned, um, challenged, um, shaped by um, landowners, shaped by the military requisitioning, shaped by um, people's ideas of what the commons should be and what access should be. Um, and hopefully, um, I'll be able to share with you a summary of the event on my own blog and keep an eye out on the Mill website again for more on the Open Spaces Society collection um, and for keep an eye also on the Open Spaces Society website for um, their campaigns and their current um, their, their current projects that they're involved with. Um, I'll be feeding all this discussion into my own work um, hopefully eventually get a book out on the history of public space which touches on many of the themes that we've discussed today um, and thanks everyone for participating um, and for all of you for keep finding those locations though I need to know where they all are just as a from a completist point of view but I hope everyone has a lovely evening um, we have a survey um, Tom has just put the um, link in the chat so if you've got any feedback about today's event um, anything you want us to know um, please do fill it in um, and see you hopefully soon in person on a hill somewhere walking from Winter Hill to Kinder Scout.